Hey, you. On today's draft class, we're going to debate the prospects that we have ranked drastically differently. And later on, we're going to discuss all the amazing rookies that are going to be appearing in the NBA playoffs, like Ben Simmons, Mitchell, Tatum, all your favorites. But first, a word from our sponsors. Today's NBA draft class is brought to you by the Google Assistant. With the Google Assistant, you can complete over a million actions on your phone, in your car, and around the house. Do you ever forget where you parked your car at a game? You're walking around the stadium after the game and can't for the life of you remember where your car is? Check this out. Hey, Google. Remember I parked in lot B, row 5? Okay, I'll remember you parked in lot B, row 5. I'll also save a map of your current location. Download the Google Assistant today. Draft class is also brought to you by GOAT. G-O-A-T. GOAT. They're a company dedicated to sneaker authenticity. In 2013, the Air Jordan 5 grape sneaker was retroed. GOAT's co-founder had to have them, so he ordered a pair in the largest resale market at the time. But when they came, the Jumpman looked odd, the tongue was flat, and the laces were too thick. Yep. Those Jordan 5 grapes were fake. So he decided to launch GOAT and create a trusted marketplace for authentic sneakers. Head over to GOAT.com slash The Ringer now and get playoff ready with some new sneakers. And now, draft class. Welcome to The Ringer NBA Show. I'm Kevin O'Connor, staff writer at TheRinger.com. This is Draft Class. Joining me on the other line is fellow Ringer staff writer, Jonathan Charks. What's up, guys? Talking to you from actually fairly sunny Portland. It's been a nice week, all things considered, weather-wise. Must be beautiful up there, John. And sitting across from me here in beautiful Los Angeles, back from a sabbatical in the mountains, is associate editor Danny Chow. You know what? I was up in the mountains last week. I had gallons and gallons of mountain spring water to cleanse me. Got all of my Mario Hazonia takes out of my system. Yes. Let's get to the draft. Let's get the playoffs rolling. And of course, as always, on the other side is our producer, Isaac Lee. Isaac, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm pumped that the playoffs are finally here. Although, uh, sadly, my beloved Clippers, they did not make wow. it in this time around. But on the Sad. flip side, it's all the more reason for me to look forward to the draft. Exactly. For all the eliminated playoff teams, now's the time to really get excited. One month away from the NBA draft lottery, a little bit over two months away from the NBA draft. It's time to go. Let's do it. So on Wednesday, we expanded the Ringers 2018 NBA Draft Guide to include 30 of my scouting reports, rankings from me, Danny Chow, Jonathan Charks. We have commentary from Roger Sherman. A lot of cool stuff. All three of us had Luka Doncic ranked first, but today we're not going to discuss the guys that we agree on. It's about disagreement, and we had a lot of those. The theme of the draft this year is big men, from DeAndre Ayton to Marvin Bagley to Jaron Jackson. So to kick off today's pod, let's start with Missouri big man Jonte Porter. He's a skilled big man who spaces the floor and does all the little things on offense, passing, screening, all that good stuff. But his defense needs work. Danny has him ranked 17th on his board. He's 20th on mine. But he's number nine on yours, Charks. Why? Well, I guess we should uh, mention off, if y'all don't know, Jonte is Michael Porter's little brother. I think he might have little Marc Gasol syndrome. He's kind of been his older brother's shadow his whole life. A little overweight right now, but he has time to get his body together. To me, I look at Jonte, I feel like there's a lot of Wendell Carter in his game. I think like he's a bigger big with some defensive issues, but I think he's a much better shooter. And I feel like he's a pure stretch five. I just love his skill. He's a pretty good defensive player in terms of his basketball IQ his rim protection, his help side defense. So to me, if I'm gambling on a bigger big, I want a guy with pure perimeter skills like Jonte. Yeah, my whole thing with Jonte is, let's get more of these types of players in the NBA. Like, he's not at the level of uh, Nikola Jokic, but you're looking at a similar type of player in that yeah. he's kind of conditionally not too fit to be playing in the NBA right now. <laughs> There's some blubber. Uh, yeah, but he's extremely intelligent. As Chark said, a great floor spacer, awesome passer. That's one of my favorite things about his game. You could see him on the short roll kicking it out to three-point shooters easily. Absolutely. That's why I wouldn't be surprised what Danny said he goes back to school because he's super young. He actually reclassified to play with Michael, which didn't really work out, unfortunately. But he's a really young guy. I think he's still 18. He could probably go back to school and work on his body more. But if he does come out, to me, he's a really big sleeper in this draft. And with me, like I have him the lowest of any of us at 20. It's not that I dislike him. 20 is a right. perfectly fine ranking. He's going to be a solid player. But I think with his passing ability, his shooting, his screening, defensive positioning, as you said, Sharks, there's a lot of good qualities in him. But the difficulty I have with your ranking, Sharks, especially, is like you have him ahead of Mo Bamba at 11. 
and ahead of Wendell Carter, who I love a lot more than you guys do. I have him sixth. You guys have him 10th and 12th, respectively. But I guess I'm curious, you know, in your evaluation, if you're a team drafting, what is it about Porter that's ahead of some of those bigger name guys like Bamba and Carter? Oh, well, see, to me, I say with Carter, I think that's why I have them like nine and 10. I think they have very similar profiles, except Fair. I would say Jonte is more perimeter oriented. As far as Mo goes, I go back and forth on Mo a lot. I'm a Texas guy. I want to rank him high, but I'm just, I'm not really sure about his skill. I'm not really sure about his feel for the game. And not even really sure he's that athletic, honestly. I think he's like, he's really long, obviously. He has a great frame, but I'm not sure about his just quick twitch. Like to me, watching him at Texas, like here's my hot take. I'd rather have Jared Allen if I'm taking a Texas big. Hmm. That's interesting because Jared Allen, he has been really, really good this year in the NBA. Right. He's a lot better than a lot of people expected him to be. He fell to 22nd. I know the Nets were like sweating bullets that he wasn't going to slip to them. They had him ranked a lot higher, like I'm sure some other teams might have as well. But I kind of wonder if maybe that's what ends up happening with Bamba at the next level. He just ends up a lot better than he might have looked at Texas because of that situation. You've probably seen that team a lot more than any of us have, Charks. Is there just something different about Bamba that you worry about a lot more than you did like with Allen? Well, to me, Allen, I just feel like when I was watching him at Texas, I was like, this guy really knows how to play basketball. He's really skilled. He's athletic enough. He's long enough. I wonder with Mo if there's some diminishing return on that 7-9 wingspan. Like, I wonder once you're past seven four, seven five, is that four inches that much more valuable than like <laughs> I don't feel know. and athleticism? It yeah. looks pretty good for Rudy Gobert, doesn't it? Danny? Yeah, but Gobert is what about Alexis Zajinka, right? There's plenty of super right. long guys who aren't very good. Yeah, and I feel like we're about what, ten years removed from Hashim Thabit. And I know that in this day and age we're not really drafting purely on measurables anymore. But I don't know. I really feel like the baseline for Mo Bamba, in terms of his like very raw base skill set, is a guy that you want in the modern NBA. Agreed. And there's the concern that maybe, oh, he's not as intense as a guy like Rudy Gobert was when he was coming into the draft. Gobert was a relentless player in Europe. And that's something that translated immediately. And that's something that's helped him kind of become the player he is now. Bamba doesn't really play with that fire, but I still think that you take a gamble on a guy with a 7'9 wingspan. And that's that's kind of the <laughs> almost the problem with the Gobert comparison. We have Gobert as one of the comps in the draft guide. But Gobert, when evaluating him in the draft, there's no question about his intensity, about his work right. ethic. The real question was, like, can he play basketball? Right now with Bamba, it's how skilled is he actually at basketball? But also there's some of those questions in terms of his intensity at the court. However, like I got in a conversation with someone on Reddit earlier this week after the draft guy had dropped. And he's like, well, do you fear the Hashim Tabit comparison for Bamba? And I just don't see it at all because with Tabit, there was always questions about his work ethic off the court. Right. How much he loved the game, how much he was willing to commit to it. Bamba, there's never been that question. We know he has a good work ethic. We know he, he at least has put the time into the game. So... Granted, we haven't seen the intensity necessarily on the court. It's been inconsistent. I think Bamba, if he were to drop out of the top 10, that, that would be a criminal mistake in my opinion. Here, here's my thing. So Bamba has famously gone to the Sloan Conference. and he's, Twice. Twice. <laughs> and he's, you know. It's a, a good bit for sure. Yeah, a it very <laughs> avowed learner. He wants to know about that. But you know what? Are you concerned that he might be a blog boy? <laughs> Is that a bad thing to be a blog boy? I don't know. Maybe. To maybe care about analytics. To, to care about <laughs> analytics. What if he's soft? What if he's soft? What if all he cares about are the advanced metrics? Maybe <laughs> that's what's holding him take. back. I'm here for Maybe it. that's this what's holding him back. Take. What's your take on that, Sharks? I mean, I don't know. Like, I'm not even so worried about the intensity, which is a concern. But to me, like, I have Bomb in this range, right? I, I kind of see him as a, more of a one dimensional big, kind of like Robert Williams. So to me, like, I think I can get a guy like that at 10, 11, 12, where I feel like Williams will give you most of what Bomb will give you. So I don't need to get him that guy at the top five pick, essentially. I just still can't see putting Porter ahead of him just because of the the potential defensive limitations. He's not a good rebounder. His athleticism is average. Yes, he could get in better shape, but he doesn't have length, right. doesn't have quickness. I don't know, man. I, he's a solid player, and I, he's going to be a pro for quite a long time, I think. But ahead of some of those other guys, whew, I have a hard time. I'm curious about the Carter versus Porter comp. Like, why is Carter so much better than Porter? I think Carter's a much better athlete. Is he, though? I mean, they're both not great athletes. Neither one of them is like a, no, uh, an Aiden Jackson. Yeah, I, I would kind of agree that, that Carter is a better athlete. He's also longer. 
Uh, he's Much got longer. he's got about more, three four inches more explosive. Does he? I Porter. thought Jonte was yeah. a seven two wingspan. No, Jonte's wingspan is actually pretty short, seven foot. Yeah, and Carter's also more oh, explosive really? around the rim. Porter stinks finishing. Obviously, still only a small sample size in college, but he didn't look great finishing around the rim. Whereas Carter, pretty explosive, even though he's not an above the rim guy, he at least gets up there quickly. I think. Oh yeah, well he is seven feet. You're right. I thought it was seven two. <laughs> Speaking about athleticism. One of the probably more athletic players, if not the most athletic big man in the draft, is Mitchell Robinson. He's a big man we had ranked drastically differently. Didn't play college basketball last season after he left Western Kentucky twice. Really weird situation last year where he was there. Then he left without telling anybody. Then he went back. And then he left again and decided to, quote, train for the drafts. But some weird stuff there as well. He's a wild card, elite athlete. The skill is the question. Already 20 years old. Danny has him 24th. Charks, you have him 27th. I have him 17th. I guess I'll just start off and saying, like, it's similar to what you like about those other guys, Charks, Robert Williams, and that similar range. I have him below them, but that athleticism is ridiculous. There's no doubt that he's a very fluid athlete. He can fly out of nowhere to block shots, potentially a great rebounder. There's concerns with him, um, but I, I do wonder if he's a project worth, in, worth investing in in the middle of the first round, Danny. The thing that sticks out with me is that his frame is pretty phenomenal. He has these kind of like enormous shoulders that remind <laughs> me of Anthony Davis. So yeah. if he wants, he can actually pack on a bunch of weight. The Hassan Whiteside route, he could definitely go into that. My concern is he has a really high center of gravity. His legs are really long. And at the next level, at the NBA level, when he has to bang with, you know, a lot of big men who can kind of handle him in terms of size— like, does he have the leverage? The high hips. Yeah, his skills are so rustic. You know, you, you see glimpses of it and you're like, oh, that's cool. But like, do you really want him doing a lot of the stuff that he did in high school in the NBA? Do you, Sharks? I would say with me, with Mitchell, I'm just fading him in terms of, right when we're watching last year McDonald's, his feel for the game and his overall skill level. Like, this is a guy who really needed to be playing basketball at this age every day against good competition. I worry a lot this year off is going to hurt him. To me, it's like your generic rim running, shot blocking five. Generic strong, but I'm not sure I need to take a gamble on a guy like that when guys like that are fairly available in the middle of the first round now. A guy with so many red flags. Here's my thing. like You could have said a very, very similar thing about Hassan Whiteside. And granted, maybe you don't want to invest in that guy in the middle of the first round, but if you're a team with right. a and, good and culture. Teams didn't. Teams yep. didn't. Yeah, right. He slipped. But see, to me, Hassan is way more, which I guess sure. he got more skilled. Like Mitchell, when I watched him last year, his skill level was concerning. Sure. But at 20 years old, that's what I mean. Like DeAndre Jordan at 20 years old as a rookie drafted in the second round by the Clippers. It took him like four or five years until we thought of him as a great defensive player, a great rebounder, an unbelievable rim runner. Before that, he was just a super raw guy. And for me, it's like maybe you invest in that guy if you're willing to commit the time. If you're a team that isn't willing to wait, you need a guy more immediately, then sure, you're definitely not going to want to waste your resources on a guy who's certainly a project. I don't, I don't disagree with you at all, Charks, on that. Maybe for us, it's we have a similar valuation. It's more about philosophy and right. the time you're willing to commit to a big rim runner like that. But I think back to something you said, Charks, maybe last week's pod or week before that, where you mentioned how maybe it's these big men that teams look for in the future, those Robert Williams types, maybe a Mitchell Robinson type, when you are spacing the floor with four shooters and then one rim-running big man, he fits that. Yeah, I guess I have a question in terms of where you see his potential comparatively with some other guys. Like, between Mitchell Robinson and, say, a guy like Justin Patton last year. I think Patton's a little bit more skilled. Mm -hmm. But then again, there's more exposure to him, right? right? You could watch endless game tape of him playing at Creighton, whereas Mitchell Robinson, it's like put them into YouTube, you know, if you want to watch back stuff. And it's <laughs> difficult to find right. things of substance. I like Patton more, also a younger player. But Mitchell Robinson is just intriguing. I mean, I have him ahead of Jonte Porter, which you think is probably nuts, Charks. I just think he's worth investing in if you're a team mm -hmm. with a good culture and good coaching staff, good player development. I think what it comes down to what you're saying about, like, philosophy, like, to me, your raw, young project bigs, unless I really believe in them, I'd rather take an older wing at that point in the draft. Like, to me, you can find, like, the, the game has changed a bit, so we're, like, raw project bigs are everywhere now. Like, if I want to find an athletic seven-footer who kind of runs around and doesn't have a great feel for the game, it isn't hard to find those guys, honestly. Seven-foot chicken? <laughs> yeah, that's, like, those guys are easier to find now. So, to me, I don't need to use a first-round pick unless I really believe in a guy like that. Speaking of, as you said, Sharks, 
guards and wings. Let's move on to Kyrie Thomas. He's a junior from Creighton, six foot three, super long arms, six ten wingspan, I believe, even though it's not listed on the draft guide. Almost twenty two years old. Defensive menace offers pretty good offense as well with a shooting ability. Ball handling needs to get better for him to expand his game. I have him fifteenth. Danny has him sixteenth. Charks, you have him twenty fourth. Danny, why do we like him so much? I think when you look at him and you look at his measurables, he compares pretty favorably to a guy like Reggie Jackson, who was, you know, 6'3", 6'4", seven-foot wingspan, kind of along the same lines, defensive menace. I just really enjoy watching him play defense. He's one of those guys who makes defense look fun. He stays (laughs) attached to his man, recovers well, can kind of glide around screens. His length kind of always puts him in position to strip the ball or intercept it. I think when you look at his body, and especially once we get to like the combine, I think the Donovan Mitchell comparisons might be inevitable. They have a pretty similar right, profile. Right or wrong, they'll be there. Right, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's something that you know Draft Express did pretty much every year in that they would compare measurables to past guys in their database. And I think those two are going to inevitably show up linked. Yeah, to me, I mean, I like Kyrie, but I think for me, like in this 15-23 range where I kind of have him right outside of it, they're just bigger and more offensively versatile wings who can do some of those same things on defense. And so, like, I mean, I like Kyrie, but I think this range is like the range in this draft where there's a ton of value, and I just value some bigger wings ahead of him. That's why I have him a little lower than y'all, I think. Is he a wing? I mean, positions are right. very tough to define, but is he a wing or is he a guard? Because there is some guard ability there with him, at least on the offensive end of the floor. Defensively, he can defend one through three, and maybe fours on super small ball lineups. I mean, like wing, he's like a two, right? Two on offense. Or I guess he could be like a guy who plays off the ball again with the point forward and guard ones. But to me, he's still like a wingish kind of player. He's yeah. not going to be an initiator, I don't think. The next I mean, he's, he's pretty much got the same size as a guy like Etuan Moore who plays the three for the Pelicans. So like at, at this point, he can probably slide in at around one to three. Um, I, I just don't know if he has the kind of dynamic moves off the dribble to really be has, kind of a lead guard. And here's why I'm super intrigued by him. He has mm-hmm. the baseline of skills, right? Sure. He yeah. has the defensive ability, as you said, Danny. He makes defense look fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, just just search Kyrie Thomas' defense on YouTube after you listen to this podcast or just watch it for a little bit. You'll have fun. He can hit spot-up threes at a really high level. He's gotten better each season, expanded, shooting a little bit off screens, off the move. It's kind of exciting. Smart player. Good good work ethic as well. And with the passing ability, the ball handling's not there, but he has some pretty solid passing vision. He knows mm-hmm. how to make the right plays, and he occasionally makes really smart passes with good velocity on the ball. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he'll ever be a point guard necessarily, but I think there's a little bit more playmaking ability that could be there if he if he takes his ball handling to a much higher level than it is now. There's something there right. that's exciting to me. I just think there's this really interesting trend at the kind of mid to late stage of the first round where you're looking at a, a lot of guys who are very much of the same profile, of the same build. You know, Melvin Frazier, uh, Josh Okogie, a, a bunch of these guys who kind of have the same skill set. And it's really just a matter of seeing which guy you like, which guy teams think can, you know, push them forward. Yeah, I mean, I think for sure you're going to see, I think we're already seeing it in most boards, like after about 13, 14, it's going to be a very wing-heavy draft. Everybody needs wings, everybody wants wings. And it's like finding out the difference between those guys, finding those small differences, I think, that makes, that's going to like get your evaluation ahead. Getting a guy like Sterling Brown in a draft is just huge for a team. And find that kind of player is just so valuable in the mid to late first round. Hey, Danny, I have a random question. I, I like your sneakers. Wow, are those Jordans? Yeah, they're Jordan 4s. Well, I asked because today's NBA draft class is brought to you by GOAT. Sneakers can be fake today, but yours don't have to be. The simplest way to make sure you don't purchase a fake pair of sneakers is by heading to GOAT. That's right, GOAT, G-O-A-T. Find signature athlete sneakers such as LeBron's, Harden's, KD's, Steph Curry's, and more on their app at GOAT.com. They're the most trusted marketplace for authentic sneakers, and they ensure buyer protection above everything else. How, you may ask? Well, all their sellers are vetted, their listings are verified, and their team of specialists examine every single sneaker by hand to ensure they're 100% authentic. That's a money-back guarantee. They look at stitching, logo placement, shape, color consistency, and smell. Yes, they smell every sneaker. So head over to goat.com slash the ringer. That's G-O-A-T dot com slash the ringer. 
Check out their authentic signature athlete sneakers, and if you see something you like, grab a pair. And now, back to draft class. One last guy to discuss that we had ranked fairly differently is Anthony Simons. He's 19 years old, six foot four guard, amazing athlete. Didn't play college basketball last year because he was at the IMG Academy, and he reclassified to insert himself into the 2018 drafts. I have him ranked 23rd. He's 28 on Danny's boards, but he's 30th on yours, Charks. Charks, I know there's been some concern that's come up this week with him. Care to share? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I've not watched him play that much. I was looking forward to watching him at Hoop Summit, but he, he pulled out at the last minute. And the people I've talked to here, they really think he's being hidden. They're very concerned that he's like all on paper and doesn't have actual like in-game feel and ability and that his people are just trying to get him a first-round contract. And so the concern a lot that's around Hoop Summit is like, how good is this guy really to be worth all the development time he's going to need? Like, is his upside high enough to justify taking in the first round if he's just kind of a guy? Like, Kevin, what's like the ups on him? Because I haven't watched him that much, really. I mean, he's an amazing athlete. Clearly has the ability to create off the dribble. I think that alone is intriguing enough. The shot needs to get better. He, I mean, he's a shot taker right now, not necessarily a shot maker. Reminds me of maybe what a teenage Lou Williams might have looked like, just a little bit bigger and more athletic than him. He's intriguing. I, I think he's worth a flyer in the late first round. Uh, unless there's other concerns, whether it's character or whether you bring him in for workouts and he just totally bombs, then yeah, that's different. I, I don't care about him not playing at Hoop Summit. What's the point? He's going to be working out for teams um, over the next coming months. He's going to be interviewing with them. He's going to do all the stuff that he needs to do to prove himself as a first round pick. Well, that's the question. It's just workouts. Like, is he going to go up against guys like Javon Carter and workouts? Or are they going to hide him in there too? Right. And if he does, that's a pretty good litmus test because Javon Carter, one of the better defensive players in college basketball, a much older guy. And he's old as hell, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, like, he's like 40 years old. <laughs> they have physically developed. I mean, if I'm if I'm Simons, that's the guy I want to go against. Not some high schoolers. If he had a bad week at Hoop Summit, people would use that against him even if it was actually worthless. So I think for him, it's like, get rid of that. Just forget it and handle the workouts. Maybe you go against a Carter who's like 22 and... Maybe you blow him away and then teams are talking about We'll see about how it. much his people believe in him by who he works out against. That'll be like the litmus test. Like, do his people really think he's that good or are they going to be playing this game the whole way through the draft process? While we're on the topic of Portland, is there any 2019 prospects out there who are standing out, Sharks? I mean, everyone's always talking about, of course, is RJ Barrett versus Cameron Reddish, the two Duke kids. And what's interesting is right now, Cameron Reddish's jump shot is way ahead of RJ's. And RJ is kind of the guy who's gotten all the love, but... His jumper has been really wonky so far out here in Portland, and that'll be a thing to watch really closely next year for a guy who could be the number one overall pick. He's airballing threes. He makes some, but some of his jump, jump shots are all over the map. So today's Thursday. Last night was the last night of the NBA regular season, and on Saturday, the playoffs begin. But actually, in between, NBA voters need to submit their ballots for Rookie of the Year, for MVP, all that good stuff, Coach of the Year, whatever. What everybody's been talking about this week, for whatever reason, is what I find to be the easiest debate out of all of them. Ben Simmons versus Donovan Mitchell, the Rookie of the Year discussion. Danny, I know you care very, very passionately about this Ben Simmons, Uh, Donovan Mitchell debate. I don't care. I don't care. Look, I am on TweetDeck all the time. I follow at least... 1,700 people on Twitter. It was on my feed for forever, and I just, I don't care. That's all I have to say about it. I, I really don't care. Charks, I know I know. <laughs> in, in our notes for the pod, you said you wanted to discuss. I'm curious about your thoughts. Well, I mean, it's just a topic of conversation. It's kind of funny that it got to be such a big deal, I guess. I don't know. I guess my only question is this. This is the last thing I'll ask about it. Should Rookie of the Year be based on the first year of the contracts rather than appearing in a game should it be just left the way it is where it's actually when you appear in your first game you become a rookie or is it ink dries it's the first year of your deal then you're a rookie so ben simmons would be in a second year i mean he's definitely the red shirt rookie of the year i think it definitely helped him a lot having that red shirt season there's no question about that it made him a better player it made him a better player but it you know it didn't fix his jumper like Mm. (laughs) you know i i i I don't know i would just leave the rule as it is i don't think there's any other year in which you are going on these types of weird ad campaigns, pretty much. It's weird. I'm just disappointed by the entire discussion. I'm sad that we even talked about it even a little bit here, because it's like... It's Simmons. It's Simmons. It's Simmons. It's Ben Simmons, and Mitchell's been unbelievable, too. But really, the underlying story is the fact that there are going to be a ton of really good rookies in the playoffs this year. you got Simmons, 
Markel Fultz just had a triple-double last night. He's looking pretty good for the Sixers. Mitchell on the Jazz, Tatum on the Celtics, Bam out of bio in the Heat. Zach Collins playing more minutes for the Blazers. OG and Anobi, a fixture in the Raptors. Really, really strong bench. Jordan Bell getting minutes for the Warriors. Even Sterling Brown, a second-round pick, getting minutes later in the season for the Milwaukee Bucks. Charks, there's a, there's a ton of rookies that are going to have to make a strong impact on their teams this postseason. What are some of the common traits that's made them successful and can help their teams in the playoffs? What's really surprised me about these guys, I mean, like a lot of them are playing really good defense, right? The knock on young guys is always, oh, they're really going to be far behind on defense. But OG and Anobi, like he's the Raptors' best perimeter defender. Jordan Bell is playing incredible defense for Golden State this year. Sterling Brown's been good on defense. That's like they've been the common thing. These guys on good teams, if you're a young player, you almost have to play good defense to get on the floor. And that's what these guys all do pretty much. Right. And I would say, with the exception of Zach Collins, all of these guys have very NBA-ready bodies. Yeah. So they were ready to absorb you know, the, the wear and tear of the league. And even with Zach Collins, they were able to bring him in slowly and now he's very much a fixture in the rotation a guy who is a very underrated defender i've been looking at the stats and the blazers actually have the best rim protection numbers in the league which is surprising yeah really between surprising. between nurkic and Stunning. collins and they both rim protect in different ways but zach collins is so agile and he's he's so smart with his placement with his hands and all of that. It's 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 really stunning to see this rookie class. Dude, I love Zach, but he's about to be sacrificed <laughs> on the altar of Anthony Day. It's gonna oh, be yeah. bad for him. You this you had Collins ranked like six at one point last year, Charles. Yeah. So so for you is is he further ahead than what you might have expected him to be? Or yeah, I mean, he's further ahead because like I, I look at his body, think oh, he'll need one or two years at least to get himself ready for the NBA. But what he's been able to do with his body that's still so underdeveloped is really impressive. He's pretty much a 3 and D guy. For sure. And, and all these guys are really ahead of where even the, the most optimistic evaluators could have been expected them to be. Nobody could have expected Tatum to be this great this soon. Right. Nobody could have expected OG and Anobi's shot to look as good as it did, especially early in the season. It's fallen off in the second half, but he made pretty solid improvement, especially after his injury. You mentioned Zach Collins, Mitchell. Nobody, nobody could have seen this coming And, and at hey, all. we were pretty high on it, We too. were. Number nine to the Knicks. Yeah. We, we, if, you know. if I remember correctly, we were one of the first sites that ever had him ranked in the lottery. I'm just saying. There it is. Nice. There you go. I'm just saying. I wonder, Tarks, is there anything you know from this group of rookies that are going to be in the playoffs that can be applied to this year's draft? Are there, are there comparisons that you see with guys that perhaps next year we'll be talking about player X and the contribution he can make to his team? This is a boring one. I already mentioned this, but like I think Sterling Brown, to me, like the value of a good, solid two-way wing on a rookie contract, like if I'm in the 20 to 30 range, I'm looking for guys like that because even on these playoff teams, like how much could Minnesota use a guy like that right now to help with, you know, guarding yeah. Harden? How much could New Orleans use a guy like that to help with guarding Dame? These guys are just so valuable. You're going to see more and more teams just like, it's all about finding wings late in the draft now. Because you find a guy like that, you can hit him on a four-year rookie contract. It's just so big for your team. Who are the wings that stick out the most? To me, I really like Raleigh Alkins. Hashtag Savage Life. Raleigh. He's got the, he's got the <laughs> NBA body. He's a really hard-nosed kid. I think it's a pretty good feel for the game. The question is the jumper, obviously. And my sleeper in this year's draft is Josh Okogi. The same kind of thing. I think o Alkins and Okogi have those NBA bodies that can come in and play right away. Yep. Okogi, we have ranked, I have him 25th. Danny, you have him 23rd. Sharks, we have him 17th. As far as I know, I'm not sure he's ranked first round anywhere else, so we're all fairly high on him. I, I don't know if there's a lot of groupthink there. Uh, we've never talked about him before today. At least I haven't with either of you guys. Um, so It's just in the air at the Ringer headquarters. <laughs> it might be in the though. air, but it's like you said, Sharks. Those three and D guys are so critically important. You're able to plug and play them into virtually any type of lineup, any type of situation. And that's what we're seeing with some of these guys, whether it's Tatum, whether it's Ananobi, whether it's Sterling Brown, or even Mitchell to an extent, even though he's a guard, he's super long and right. still can defend multiple positions, or Ben Simmons, able to defend multiple positions. Anytime you're versatile, it's a skill that allows you to get on the floor early on as a young player. And that's the key is getting on the floor, is like getting a coach to give you minutes, especially if you don't go to like a bottom 10 team. That's like the number one thing is like, will your coach trust you to play? And all that's going to happen is you play good defense and you can switch screens these days just about. So if a guy can't do that, it's hard to get minutes. Quickly, first round playoff predictions. I'm curious what you guys have. Who's going to win the first round? Danny, 
Let's go with you first. I'm I'm kind of going chalk. I'm I'm a, I'm a bit of a boring guy. Raptors, Celtics, Sixers, Cavs, Jazz, Blazers, Rockets, Warriors. No upsets. Give us one non-chalk pick, though. So right before this podcast, I saw a tweet that said Kawhi was going to play in the in game uh, one. Yeah, yeah. And I completely <laughs> fell for a Bleacher Report retweet that happened in 2017. I saw that. So I was going to be like, oh yeah, you know, Spurs are, Spurs are going to do it. You know, justice for Shea Serrano. But I really think the, the Warriors. You said Utah, right? Yes. So in actual, you do have one quote unquote upset, the five of the four. Oh, okay. So, one, yeah. so, so one. Does Utah have home court in that series? No, no they're the five. No. Utah. Okay. Uh, okay. Oklahoma City's four. How about you, Charks? Um, I'm thinking for my non shock one, I'm going to go with New Orleans. I want to see. You. I think Anthony Davis, man. I'm ready for just like the year of Anthony Davis to go, go skyrocketing. I don't think Portland can guard him at all. He could put up some absolutely insane numbers. That to me is the most fun series of the first round. I can't wait for that one. So, so you have all the favorites in the East Houston, Golden uh, State, Oklahoma City. I want to, I, I'll. T- I'll take Milwaukee. Just take Giannis. Whatever. Okay, that's fair. I have Toronto, Boston, Philly, Cleveland, Houston, Golden State, New Orleans over Portland, then Utah over Oklahoma City. I think that New Ooh, Orleans... Oh, Utah over OKC. That's interesting. I think that New Orleans-Portland series is fascinating. That, though. to me, is the most interesting one of the first round. Drew Holiday, Rajon Rondo, playoff Rondo. Playoff Rondo. I mean, Completely on, forgot man. about that. Playoff Ooh. Rondo. I mean, against Dame Lillard and CJ McCollum, that's going to be tough. And who stops AD, like you said, Sharks? That'll be fascinating. <laughs> Let's go, Zach. Let's go, Zach Collins. I- Isaac, yeah. before we get to grades, who's going to win it all? Who's going to win it all? That's a good question. I believe this year, I would bet the field against a Golden State Warriors, Cleveland Cavaliers finals. I would bet the field. Yeah, me too. Interesting. I think I'll take Golden State Cleveland again. I'll be boring. Isaac, you get some grades for us? Of course I do. Let me start with Danny Chow. Welcome back, first of all. Thank you. I hope you had a great time in the mountains. I would like to nickname you today Conspiracy Chow because you called Mo Bamba a blog boy. And <laughs> the, the, your concerns with him were about whether he is too smart or something, like if he's analytically obsessed. I really enjoyed that take. Also, your contrarian apathy towards the Ricky of the Year debate. I do think that these guys should be fighting to get their bonus and their contract and getting that money. But I, I still appreciate your apathy. So you get an A for apathy. Yes. I think it's all about alliteration these days. Amazing. It seems like. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like to make things poetic. <laughs> Moving on to Jonathan Charks. You're in Portland, Oregon for the Nike Hoop Summit. Off air, you told us that you went to the Nike employee store. But to my knowledge, you did not get me a pair of kicks. Therefore, you get an F. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. They're actually really cheap. I should have gotten you some shoes. Come on, man. You have my number. You should have, you should have texted me. You should have called me something. I think my credit card is maxed out. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, a good excuse. excuse. Oh, yeah. man. Kevin O'Connor, you oh, padded right. your own back for last year's Donovan Mitchell evaluation. I padded all of our backs, Isaac. Yeah, exactly. I, I like that pride that you have in our draft guide. It's really admirable. I'm going to also give you an A, and that leaves Charks the yeah. only one failing today's class. Just Jeez. think I called in from, I could be in Portland or not, the Portland <laughs> Zoo. I'm here with this podcast getting ass. <laughs> well, well, that was fun. Jonathan, thank you for phoning in from Portland. Go enjoy the Portland Zoo. It's great, man. All right, y'all. Danny, Isaac from here in beautiful Los Angeles. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go, quick PSA. Did you know that rating the Ringer NBA show five stars on iTunes is proven by Ringer scientists to improve happiness by 6.9%? It's amazing. So please do that out of the kindness in your heart. Thank you. Our music is provided by the band Oso Oso. Go check them out. They kick ass. They're fun. And for extra credit, please check out The Ringer's 2018 NBA Draft Guide at nbadraft.theringer.com. Special thanks to Elon Musk for being a great friend, huge NBA fan, the best dunker I know, and a loyal listener of the show. Hopefully he joins us in the future. He's a tough guy to nail down, but... Uh, I think we'll get him eventually. Most of all, thank you so much for listening. Have fun living life and watching the NBA playoffs this weekend. Peace out. Peace out.